I would say that my motivation and drive is, is is that I like what I do. So therefore, you know, it gets me up every morning. Maybe when I started, it might have been, it's a job and it pays my bills. But uh, over the years, it, it's become more than that. You know, again, it's, it's why I get up in the morning. I look forward to, to going and doing. Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we're going to have a fun with a hero episode where we're talking to Mr. Bill Metcalf, who is the Director of Information Systems at Global Process Automation. Welcome, Bill. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you and looking forward to going through this with you and uh, knowing we're trying to inspire people here. And, and one way we love to kick these hero episodes off is just giving the, you the chance to walk through your personal journey to, to the role that you're in now. Okay. I actually started mid-90s, and uh, my initial job was to start to do the migration from DOS to Windows 95, so that, that kind of gives my age away a little bit. I have been doing this for the past 24 years. I've done a lot of work in data collection, so taking these uh, silos of information and connecting them up to data historians, in different NES systems in order to bring actionable data from the plant floor to the business units, kind of as a necessity. I got involved with networking because uh, obviously connecting these systems together requires a great deal of knowledge and networking and, and how things communicate. So that was kind of how I got started on my journey. I've worked in um, just about every manufacturing vertical possible. And I've seen things that would make your hair stand up. Really? I'm sure you have, Bill. And hopefully we get into some of those today. Now, for, for experiencing a role like you, you know, from a school standpoint, where where'd you study and where would you recommend for the people that want to get and follow a path like yours to start investing their time? There are lots of great colleges. I went to Florida State. And so, you know, maybe that was more of a party college. But there are uh, lots of great engineering programs out there. I think uh, having a solid foundation clearly will help. If you've already started that foundation, there are tons of resources on the Internet. You know, as I said, I do a lot of data analytics. And I do a lot of networking and, and network security. There are different OEMs that, that have a wealth of information and training that, that's available free uh, online. So, you know, depending on where you're at, if you're, just fresh out of school and you, you want real world examples, listening to podcasts like this from people who've been in the trenches forever is great. Like I say, these training videos, a lot of the OEMs have specific training videos that, that, that teach you different techniques and whatnot, uh, all of which are great for furthering your career in, in automation and industrial control systems. No doubt. No doubt. So Florida State, huh? Yeah. I hear you. I had a roommate in college, and he actually went to Florida State. He had a uh, he was there for two semesters, had a wonderful time, and a zero point zero GPA. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. But no, in all seriousness, though, no, it's it, you're right, man. There's so many different paths to take, and I think listening to people like you will, will help inspire and give uh, that guidance to the to the next generation. And man, you're an industry all the time and you have such a diverse background there are a lot of challenges out there right now so what do you what are you seeing as some of the greatest challenges the industry has over the next you know few years i think probably the greatest challenge is going to be living up to the promise of digital transformation industry 4.0 as we progress we're taking in many cases legacy systems and we're trying to bring them up into what is, is now considered, you know, commonplace, being able to access data on our tablets, on our cell phones, being able to connect to the cloud, uh, use AI, that type of thing. And so I think our, our greatest challenge is going to be how we can 
capitalize on this, how we can get data from not only new systems, but legacy systems, and be able to securely communicate those across all parts of the business. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, great, great point. I mean, that, that whole, everybody talks about digital transformation and, and industry 4.0, but it's a, it's a long road to get there, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> so if you were to go and to be able to give some advice for people that want to come into this industry, what would that be? I'd have to say is, is be ready for a challenge. And again, being across multiple different manufacturing verticals, Everything has a challenge, but you know, it's, it's a career, right? And so those challenges are what makes it interesting. Every day you go in and there's something new. If it's not new and it's not interesting, it's just a job. And, and I think at least from, from my opinion, manufacturing is something that, that always delivers something new, something different. I don't feel like, you know, I'm going in and, and going into the cubicle farm every day. I get to go out, I get to meet lots of people and I get to see lots of interesting things. Right. You know, so far as developing people and seeing people and meeting them, what do you find yourself doing, you know, from a pay it forward standpoint and trying to, to bring up others? Is, are there any types of programs or just personal mentorship that you're offering uh, to others in their development? Um, so internally we do so, some mentoring. Of course, we always try to look for, uh, co-ops from the engineering schools that give them that opportunity to to get their hands on things and get some real world experience. So so that's primarily where we focus. Like I say, you know, co-ops, and uh, a lot of times we'll hire you know junior engineers or people who are just out of school, and and we pair them with senior people so that the senior people can get them up to speed, help them understand how things work uh, in the real world, if you will. Absolutely. Now, so far as you personally, are there any mentors that you have and, and what did they do specifically that impacted you in your journey? So <laughs> I've had a couple of uh, couple of men mentors who have influenced my journey in positive ways and maybe some not in such positive ways. But uh, I, I would say that of all of my mentors, the, the kind of the message was, if you set your mind to doing something, you can do that. And I know that sounds really cliche, but a lot of times being afraid of what comes next or being afraid of what the outcome is holds us back. And so, you know, sometimes we have to take a leap of faith and sometimes we have to uh, face a challenge, if you will, in order to learn from that challenge to be able to move forward. And as I say, when I, when I started out, I started out in pulp and paper and, uh, you know, I had some, some awesome mentors there who had been in the industry way longer than I had. And like I said, I think that's probably one of the biggest takeaways is, is if there's something that you want to do, go after it and, and, and don't hesitate, go after it and be successful. No doubt. No doubt, Bill. You know, if you were to think about projects and things that get you excited about the future, you know, you're in so many different things that, that, that are changing so fast. What gets you pumped up? <laughs> so, I, you know, and I know this may sound silly, but uh, as AI has been evolving and, and process mapping and things like that, to me, that's, that's new territory, right? That's new ground to cover. And so I find that very interesting. And I, I also find very interesting as we, you know, I deal a lot with networks and security, how we're applying some of those metrics and, and, and we're applying things now like software defined networks and things like that. Just the technology of it in the advancements that, that we've made within the last couple of years and the promise of what we're going to do in the next five, 10 years. Um, to me, that gets me excited you know i want to dig in i want to learn more and, and i want to be involved with that so how are you going about that are, are there certain areas that you go to study for this type of stuff just curious you know what are some of the paths that you're taking here to advance your learning you know with ai in these different areas so some of it is uh from the internet like everybody else i learn a lot really from different um sales and, and uh, distributor presentations, things like that. I, I learn a lot. 
I've been in the business enough that I'm not necessarily going to jump at every little shiny object that somebody dangles in front of me. And, and you know, I have that ability to, to do that critical thought process through, is this an advantage? Is this moving forward? Is this something that's sustainable? It's through you know sales channels. It's through the internet. Um, there are several great LinkedIn groups that, that, that I'm a part of. And uh, there are several groups. I also do a lot of programming. Uh, there are several groups that, that I follow uh, and get involved with that, that deal specifically with programming around R and, and some of the AI technology that's out there. Okay, that's great. I mean, thank you for sharing that. Definitely gives you know, the people who are trying to, to follow a path an idea of, of things that you study. And I, kinda, I like asking this question this way. When you're, when you're in that moment of what I call flow, where it, it's rocking, you're doing what you love to do. What are you doing at that moment? Sleeping. Well, that, that's a great answer. <laughs> Maybe all right, to clarify, doing what you love to do at work. And now it could oh, be the same work. answer. So <laughs> be careful here. Yeah. 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 Don't want, don't want to tell too many secrets. Right. Um, I think that, uh, probably, uh, actually engineering network. So it's, it's kind of between the, the engineering sitting at the drawing board or, you know, at the whiteboard and mapping everything out. But then I also kind of like that, you know, when I get that opportunity out in the field and actually boots on the ground and, and, and plugging in cables and terminating cables and stuff like that. I love that stuff. I'm a hands-on guy and, and, and I really do enjoy doing that kind of thing. Now that's pretty cool. Now that that kind of leads me into my next question because I wouldn't have anticipated I would the the field work being the piece that you enjoy. So maybe this is a great uh, an area here for you. If you if you were to have a chance to to debunk a myth about your profession or about uh, you know people in roles like yourself, what is that myth out there that you're like? You know what? That's not what we do. This is what we do. So I guess there's a couple. So I guess the first one is is not all nerds know how to speak Klingon. I just never picked it up. Um, but I think the other thing is is uh, as my daily job, um, you know, I'm dealing with networks and I'm dealing with control systems, and I'm not the guy to call when your printer breaks or, or your your iPad's not working. Um, my wife all the time is on her iPhone asking me why isn't this working and I'm not an expert at that. Right. So you're not, you're not the go-to IT guy, right? Right, right. I'm with you. I'm with you. Well, thank you for clarifying that. So, and Bill, you've had such a, a great career so far. Is there anything that stands out as a highlight that you'd like to share? No. No highlights. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess uh, one of the things that uh, – kind of a, a little bit tongue-in-cheek maybe is the fact that I'm still here and I'm still doing it. You know, I have a lot of things in my life that I do, and, you know, there are a lot of things, you know, you do for a year or two and you're really into it, and then you, you know, it kind of falls by the wayside. You lose interest in it. And I have to say I've been with this company for the last 24 years, and sometimes I want to pull my hair out but at the end of the day, I still like to get up and go to work in the morning. And I, and, and I, I kind of take pride in that, 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 you know, I've been able to, to keep up with the technology because the technology has changed tremendously, you know, over the last 20 something years, but that I still find it enjoyable. I still like to do it. That's wonderful, man. Some days it can be very stressful, but you know, I'm with you though. When you, when you're actually at a company and you're, and you, you've been there and you put in a time and you're, you're loving what you're doing. It's nothing like it. Uh, and so that's great to hear. Uh, you know, it's, it definitely sounds like, you know, you know GPA is, is taking care of you and, and you have a lot of pride in what you do. And uh, so maybe now we can take a turn down a, we'll go down a dirt road here. We'll get off of the, the corporate world and talk about you outside of work. You know, okay. what, what, what are some hobbies you have, man? I like to fish when I get a chance. And I like to play music. I've, I've played music since I was eight years old. And so, you know, whenever I get that little bit of alone time, I like to just play some music. So what do you, what are you playing? Is that guitar, piano? What, what type of? Uh, um, CDs, the radio, uh, YouTube, 
Okay. Very cool, man. <laughs> no, guy. I uh, <laughs> I learned to play the guitar when I was eight years old, and uh, since then, I've probably picked up every instrument with strings. And and I'm not saying that I can play them well, but uh, I can make sound come from them. So. Uh, just about anything with strings on it, I I like to play with. Okay, any any certain genres that you enjoy? Well, ag again, I started off early, so you know I went through the garage band phase, and you know played a lot of rock and roll. Um, here a few years ago, I I kind of got pulled into bluegrass a little bit, just because it's it's the speed and the rhythm. It's very challenging. And so um, here, as of late, if I'm going to pick up and, and, and play something, it's, it's probably going to be bluegrass. Okay. So have you started messing with a, a banjo or a mandolin or anything like that? So, um, yes, I, I have a five-string banjo, and uh, I started uh, playing the mandolin and got into that enough that I've actually made my own mandolin. I, I'm actually working on a second one right now. Curiosity just went through the roof. So, what did you make this out of? Out of some some, some wood. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are some basically wood kits that you can buy. So the you know the top and the back are spruce. The block for the neck is maple. So you can buy kits at different levels. And so basically, I bought wood and and sat down and and built it and. Uh, that's a, that was a fun project. So what did you learn throughout that? Were you able to do it all in one kit? Did you have to get multiple kits, or how did that work? Well, I, I was able to do it all in one kit, and, and I think conservatively speaking, you know, working, carving out, uh, you know, the intricate details and all of that, I think I only lost maybe a pint of blood. Um, so we, we was kind of happy with that. So there weren't any pieces left over to make, like, another small instrument or anything, right? Uh, well, there's a couple of screws, but, you know, there's always a couple of screws loose when you play bluegrass music. So <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, I mean, I, I don't play, a, you know, bands or anything, but maybe I can come play the jug while you're while you're picking on that mandolin. There you go. And there's always room for spoon players, too. That's right. My luck, I'd bring some forks, and I, I still wouldn't sound good. <laughs> well, that's great. Sounds like you got some fun hobbies out there. You, and by the way, you should probably get out to uh, – where is it at? Floyd? Have you ever been out there to their bluegrass festival? I have not. That's a that's a good one to go to. Uh, they have a you know it's a, it's a big following, so I think somebody like you, as passionate as you are, you probably you would enjoy it, and it sounds like you'd fit right in with them, and it's a a good time. So we also love to talk on these hero episodes just about family. So anything you like to share with with our listeners on your family and what's going on at home. Okay, so um, I'm married to my wife, Jean. Uh, I think we've been married close to 100 years, but I think it's it's probably closer to 40 years. I have children, stepchildren, grandchildren. Um, right now, I would say we're empty nesters, but uh, we've got two Pomeranians and a, and a Tomcat. So uh, technically, I guess, you know, we're not completely at home alone. But uh... Well, that's great. So... Well, we're going to go with the 40 years, not the 100. Maybe it, maybe it feels like 100 to her. Could that be more accurate? Uh, you know, I, again, I don't know whether it's patience or medication, um, but it's it, it's worked out well for us. <laughs> well, that's great. Now, maybe we'll put that in the tagline for this, uh, you know, for this episode, patience or medication. You figure it out, you know. But uh, <laughs> that's great. You know, Bill, uh if you had, I love it. I'm very curious with your answer to the way this is going. If you had a big bucket of money and you could spend it anywhere, where would you put that at right now? Retirement. There you go. I, I think you didn't go. <laughs> I didn't know where you would go with it, but I wanted to, to throw that out there for you. <laughs> I was going to say either retirement or lottery tickets. That's right. Well, it could be one and the same, you know, you just, you never know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you're out of Wilmington. I uh, mm -hmm. love that part of the world. Any advice for people who are traveling down there to certain areas or certain spots that you're like, if you come to this area, man, you got to go here. So I guess going back to, to family life. So, so I uh, grew up in Florida. I met a woman from West Virginia. 
And so for us, Wilmington was kind of that middle ground, right? We, we were close enough to everybody's family and, and, and that worked out. And, you know, again, that's been that hundred years ago when we first moved to Wilmington. And Wilmington at that time was a very small community. And so over the years, Wilmington has grown and grown and grown and grown. So my advice to people who have not been to Wilmington, stay away. <laughs> All right. All right, so we're I'm with you on this. Okay, stay away. So let's say that you can't stay away and you really want to come there. Any certain spots that you know, locals only type deal that you'd like to share? For for me, um, you know, the south end of Carolina Beach, so uh Curry Beach. Uh if you're into history, there is a wealth of history, you know, whether it's uh uh, Civil War history. Um, there's an Air Force base that, that's down at Fort Fisher. A lot of people don't even realize it's an Air Force base. Um, of course, we've got, you know, the battleship right here. And if you come to Wilmington, you know, you need to plan on eating. Back in the day when they had telephone books, there was more yellow pages for restaurants than there were like residential phone numbers. So if you come to Wilmington, you know, be ready to eat. No doubt about it. And I guess if you're going all the way down to the south end of, of uh, Kerr Beach, then down there, you got to get a Brit's Donut while you're there, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, very good. Well, Bill, we've really enjoyed this conversation, getting to know you. You're, you're a ton of fun. We always, we call it Eco Ask Why, so we love to get to the why. You know, and the why for, for these episodes is down to purpose and what drives you. So if you were to have to answer that, what would be your, your, your motivation and your drive? That's a, <laughs> that's a hard one. You know, uh, I would say that my motivation and drive is, is, is that I like what I do. So therefore, you know, it gets me up every morning. Maybe when I started, it might have been, it's a job and it pays my bills. But uh, over the years, it, it's become more than that. You know, again, it's, it's why I get up in the morning. I look forward to, to going and doing. Absolutely. Well, Bill. I think our listeners know why you get up and you're a ton of fun and, and any chance they would get to engage with you, I think would be a good engagement. I've enjoyed it. I think you've inspired a lot of people. I mean, you, you've, you've done so many different things and you're so good at all of them. And uh, so you're an inspiration. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Really enjoyed this hero episode sitting down and talking with you today, sir. Well, thank you. I'm happy to do it. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.